turn your Bibles to John chapter 7. We'll pick up in verse 37 this morning. Remind you, you need your Bible when you come to church. Amen? If you don't have one, go to the bookstore. If you really need one, we'll give you one. We believe that the Bible is the living Word of God, and it transforms lives, hearts, and minds for the purpose of the King and His kingdom. And so as we finish up chapter 7, a message that I've entitled, uh, You Can't Make Them Drink. Probably many of you have heard that proverb or axiom or maybe an idiom, uh, depends on what you want to call it. But you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Now if you've ever owned horses, you know they have a mind of their own. Uh, back in the 1970s and early 1980s, my family was actually involved in uh, the racehorse industry here in California. Not proud of that, but uh, I know horses fairly well. Built some fairly large horse ranches all over the state. And, and I remember one, if, if you used to travel south and you went past the Fleur Corporation buildings, Bob Fleur owned a ranch out in Murrieta, which we developed. And I remember very specifically uh, working on that ranch as it was under development and there was a whole section that had been finished but was kind of out of the way of the rest of the paddocks and barns. And I remember walking down one of the aisles there and finding a horse that had died. That horse died from thirst. It was in a paddock that had an automatic water waterer in it. It constantly had water. It just decided it did not want to drink. And thereby, in the wonderful Murrieta sun, uh, it went home to horsey heaven. People are like that with regard to the gospel message, with regard to the truth. And Jesus is now entering this time where he's going to unveil the plan of God in a very precise way and he's going to offer up information that if it's believed is sufficient to bring people into a right relationship with God by believing on the name of the only Son of God so that they can be saved. But we're going to see that you can in fact lead people to water, but you cannot make them drink. Jesus will speak that message as we pick up in verse 37 here in John chapter 7. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so blessed to be able to read these words, Lord, that you, Jesus, spoke to this crowd there in the temple. Lord, as they were finishing up this incredible feast of tabernacles, so symbolic of your mission. And God, we pray that these words wouldn't fall on deaf ears here today. But Lord, we would hear and know, and God, as we hear these words, that we'd believe them, that would change our lives. Bless us with understanding, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 37, here in John 7, on the last day, that great day of the feast, so the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, could have been the seventh, likely is the eighth, this final day of praise. And we know very specifically what happens on that final day. Thanks to the Bible itself and to Jewish historians, and we'll get there in a moment, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's important to see the context and we'll go there in a moment. Jesus took a very specific moment in time to speak a very specific message to a very specific group of people so that they might actually be confronted with the truth of the gospel message. Jesus was very clear that as people were listening to him, many of them heard the truth, but they did nothing with it. They even understood who Messiah would be, 
but when they saw Messiah, rejected him. That unfortunately is with us to this day. People can hear the truth. People can understand the truth. The truth can be preached. The gospel message can go forth. And people can choose inside of that message, seeing it, hearing it, maybe even reaching the the place of some form of believing the message, but they can still reject the message. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. And remember that the Holy Spirit, now as you receive Christ and believe on his name is the gift that is given. The Holy Spirit resides within you now. The Holy Spirit was in the world, but not in individual believers until the Holy Spirit was given. And so Jesus is talking about the miracle of salvation. He's saying this is one of the things that happens to you as a child of God. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so he qualifies his own statement. And therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. And notice singular. The one they'd been looking for, Messiah of old. They began to put two and two together. They began to assemble all of the things that Jesus had said. And it began to make that unified message that perhaps they were actually seeing the Messiah. And others said, this is the Christ, the Anointed One. But you can also see that not everyone felt that way. You get a lot of different responses as a pastor to the Gospel message. And I can tell you some break my heart. Some bring me great joy as you watch the light bulb go on, as that uh, epiphanal moment happens in someone's life when they believe and receive the gospel instantaneously, becoming a child of God. It's an exciting thing, but it's a painful thing when you speak the truth and you watch someone walk away. Notice what they now begin to say. Will, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Questioning. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David, from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? You you see, they were beginning to make their own story out of the facts. Jesus actually was born in Bethlehem, was he not? But here they're they're looking at this, well, he, he lives in Galilee, he couldn't be the Messiah. We could modernize this. We, we all have places we could think of. Well, nothing good comes out of Fontana. <laughs> you know, we, we all have places we could think of. You say, well, no, there's no way the Messiah is coming from there. And that's basically what they're saying. Those guys are hicks from the sticks. They had two brain cells. One got lonely and died. And so there was a division among the people because of him, and now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. They can't make up their mind. They don't even know what to do with this. Truth mixed with error, and that is the world that we live in to this day. And then the officers came to the chief priests, the Pharisees, who said to them, why have you not brought him? Like, look, this is a simple thing. The guy's a heretic. Grab him, snatch him, bring him here. We'll take care of this. And the officers answered, well, because no one has ever spoke like this man. Have you listened to him? Even some of the people within the Jewish religious leadership are starting to have their hearts turned towards the fact this might well be the Messiah. Have you actually listened to him? And the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? And I want you to notice how this argument unfolds. 
have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? In other words, is there anybody among us, the holy anointed ones, that have actually listened and believed? Is there anyone in our religious sphere of influence that's actually believed on this guy? I mean, we are the ones who have all the knowledge. That's the reaction of religion. And it's the re reaction of religion today. We alone have the truth. Look, the truth of the matter is Jesus saves. There's one Savior. There's one Lord. There are lots of different ways the church actually looks. And probably every church in the world has its own set of flaws that if you looked at it, you could say, well, maybe that's not quite the way it should go. That's why we believe in the gospel. We believe on his name. But this crowd does not know, that does not know the law, is a curse. In other words, they're, they're still clinging to the law, the system, religion, the feast days, the temple itself, the ground the temple sits on. They were willing to worship everything except for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The gospel to them was too simple. The message of Christ just put to, to bed all of the, the religiosity that they believed in, and they couldn't handle it. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, being one of them. Remember, Nicodemus was also a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a learned man, but Nicodemus was a changed man. He had given his life to Jesus. And so he comes to his defense. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? He's actually trying to speak truth into a fallacious situation. These guys are building up a case when there is no case. Jesus has not spoken against the law. Jesus has meticulously torn down their arguments, but he does not fit in their mold. Can I tell you something? Jesus may not fit in your mold. You're supposed to fit into his mold. The word is supposed to transform you. You don't get to transform the word. Praise God for it. Because you leave us to our own demise, oh boy, can we mess stuff up. And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Now, interestingly enough, that statement, no prophet has arisen out of Galilee, is actually not true. But if you say something long enough and loud enough, and if it comes from a person with enough letters after their name, eventually people begin to think that it's true. Because there was a very famous prophet who came out of Galilee. His name was Jonah. And Jesus says, No sign shall be given unto you except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Because Jonah was three days in the grave and Jonah was raised up. And so the answer to their own assumption here would have actually pointed them towards Jesus. You see, you can lead them to water, but you can't make them drink. They wanted that bitter water. They wanted to be apart from God. They, they had already chosen their path. There's some lessons we can learn from this feast, and they're important to us, because this is the last day. So for seven days, the priest would march around the temple. They would go to the pool of Siloam. They would bring water back to the temple compound. They would eventually make it up to the temple proper itself. And in the portico of the temple proper, there would be two silver basins. And into one they would pour water, into the other they would pour wine, and they would do it simultaneously. So now imagine Jesus said, come to me if you're thirsty. 
as they're pouring water into the basin and wine into the basin, what was Jesus' first miracle? Turned water into wine. The very thing that they were doing on the last day of the feast, and Jesus shouts out, you got the wrong water. But you can see the picture. And then they would shout from Isaiah's prophetic view of Messiah. With joy you will draw water from the well of salvation. So you see the symbolism is very rich and extremely deep in this scene. Jesus took opportunity to remind them, every single thing you're doing today points to me. But they missed it. They, they couldn't believe that God could use someone from Galilee. They didn't even stop long enough to investigate fully, because if they had, they would have known that he was actually born in the city of David. There's just an assumption because of the people he hung out with. Be careful, because God still uses the foolish things to confound the wise. There's so much symbolism, in fact, that as they're running around chanting, save now, save now, save now, and Jesus at that time yells out, I'm right here. And imagine it. You want the work of the Spirit of God? I'm right here. You see, when Moses struck the rock and water poured out, you were kept from dying of thirst, but I have some other type of water for you. You see that whole picture, as you think on these things, the, the prophet Haggai had actually on the same date uh, talked about the old temple, the former temple. Uh, that passage there that's in chapter 2 of the book of Haggai pictures this, this former glory and he even was speaking of a time when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would come, but they refused to put those things together. Don't let that be you. Let the simplicity of the gospel message and the truth of the Bible penetrate your heart. Let it go where it needs to go and do what it needs to do. You see, Jesus was clearly referring back to Exodus 17. And there in verse, the first seven verses it says this, And then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Now, I want you to notice Moses' response, because it's spot on. Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? He says, you're barking up the wrong tree. Don't get angry with me. The Lord's been taking care of us since we got here. And if he doesn't take care of us, we're all dead. He's making a New Testament picture for them in the Old Testament times. And verse 3 says, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses. And ultimately, he said, Have you brought us out here so that we would die? The water was available, but they wanted water on their own terms. We get water on Jesus' terms. Amen? He gives freely to all who ask, but you have to ask and you have to commit to his lordship. You got to do things his way. He's God, and we are not. Amen? 
And so he stands, he said, look, if you're thirsty, come to me. And the water he was offering was a whole bunch better than Evian. People, you know, sometimes, I, I kind of marvel at it myself. You know, you go into the store, you know, the most expensive beverage in almost any grocery store uh, that you can buy, apart from alcoholic beverages, which I do not encourage you to go purchase, is water. Bottled water actually is more expensive than gasoline. And you can't dump it in your car. It's amazing what people, what lengths people will go to to get water. Why? Because water is life. And this water is spiritual life. Without it, you will perish. But with it, you will live eternally. You you see, Jesus is making this picture bold for them. He's saying, look, this water for drinking, which symbolizes the work of the Spirit, and this water for washing, which symbolizes the work of the Word in your life, you both need to drink it, and you need to be bathed in it. Because we have a problem. We are sinners, and we desperately need a Savior. We need the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so as Jesus is saying, look, I'm right here. Here's the water. If you want it, you can have it. If you want eternal satisfaction, come to me. If you want temporal satisfaction, if you want to have your thirst quenched for today, then grab a bottle of Evian. Go over there to the well. You want to go to the well that is Jesus. Because in Him there is life. Basically, the priests were actually proving positively Jesus' point. Because every time they finished with this ceremony, guess what they needed to do the following year? Again, they would have to march around the temple complex, go down to the pool of Siloam, come back and dump the water into the basins again. And again, and again, and again, and again. And those basins themselves could not produce either the water or the wine. And Jesus said, I'll fill up your basin. While you guys are here dumping these pots of water into these basins, these silver chalices that you're using, while people are shouting, come and drink of the water of the well of salvation, I'm right here. All you got to do is believe. What stopped them? What was the problem here with these people? And these are questions for us today, because you will either have some of these questions, or you will know someone who has some of these questions, maybe all of these questions. The first thing, when you think about how they're responding, they were hung up in meaningless details. I constantly will have people say something to the effect, well, I don't go to church because there's no good church. And I say, amen. And if you ever find the perfect church, please don't go there because you will be the one that ruins it. (laughs) You're never going to find a perfect anything on this earth. Just get over it. If you're looking for perfection in this life, you will be sorely disappointed. And so people get hung up in meaningless details. I've gotten into discussions about, well, you know, I don't think this word was in the King James, but it's in the New Living Translation and vice versa, and people go back and forth, and it doesn't even change the meaning of the context of the passage of Scripture, but they got to haggle over the one word. And for 40 minutes, we go back and forth, well, you know, is it this word in the Greek, or is it that word in the Greek, and at the end of the day, it means the same whichever word you use. Meaningless details like where Jesus came from recently kept them from seeing Messiah. 
So he hung out in Galilee. If they'd actually answered their own question, they would have realized that Jonah came from Galilee. Be careful of meaningless details. There's no perfect church, no perfect pastor, there's no perfect ministry. There's, there is not perfection to be found on this earth. And if you're looking for human perfection, you will always have an excuse to neither be engaged in church or even to have anything to do with God's people because we are a flawed bunch. Amen? Amen. Amen. Just get in. Be part. They refuse to believe the Word of God. The Word of God, Jesus is standing right in front of them. And He's told them truth. But they won't receive it. It's like, nope, don't want to believe that. They wanted to believe they already knew the truth. You know something I can tell you after 30 plus years of ministry? I don't know everything that's in the Bible. Your pastor doesn't know everything that's in the Bible. And I spend a lot of time in the Bible. And that's not braggadocious in any way, shape, or form. That is a sign of how much richness is in there because no one's going to find it all out while you're here. But I can tell you this, every time I go to the Word, I get something. Go to the Word. Let the Word speak to you. The Word will transform you. I love the third one because this is a real common one I get. They were too intelligent. They were too smart to believe this simple gospel message by this obviously unlearned Galilean carpenter who was speaking like no one had ever spoken before. You see, they missed the message because they didn't like the messenger. Jesus wasn't carrying around a bunch of degrees. You know, it's like, well, I went to this school in Galilee and I studied under this rabbi. He was the rabbi of rabbis. He didn't need someone to teach him. He was the living word of God. The people are going, well, what school did you come from? Well, rabbi did you study under? But we don't know him. I've had this experience. One of my trips, I was in Brazil, and I was given an opportunity which I love these kind of opportunities. I was doing a series on creation science, and I was invited to the local college in Campo Morao to go and speak to the students on both geology and engineering based on the ark. And the professors thought they had me. And we started going through the creation account and they didn't have any answers. I taught two separate classes on two different nights, and two different professors gave their life to Jesus. They thought they were too smart. Then they realized, hmm, maybe I don't know everything. Be careful. Smart religious people are some of the most difficult people to reach because they think they're already there. But the truth still sets people free. Amen? Amen? It's his word. It's his works. And this man, Nicodemus, steps in. And he, he takes some blows for Jesus. And I love this. You can almost see, you can almost see him going, hey, hey, guys. Have you actually heard about some of the miracles he did? Do you have any explanation for any of that? And he gave testimony that the miracles were actually to validate the message. So if the miracles happened, and he says they point to the message, do you think maybe the message is actually truth? He got them thinking. The rest of this, they, they do the same thing that people still do today. If they can't win the argument, they just try and shout you down or scream and yell. It's like politics 101. 
Oh, yeah, well, your mama has army boots. So, yeah, well, you know what I'm saying. You just attack somebody. So they attack Jesus. They don't get very far. You try and make them stumble. The only problem is they're dealing with God, and God don't stumble. He's never wrong. They're not going to trap him. They won't pin him into a corner. They try multiple times throughout John's gospel to back Jesus into some kind of intellectual corner that he can't get out of. And every single time they're like, ah, didn't get him that time either. Then they just dismiss the truth out of hand. You, You see, you can't make people drink. Jesus is the incomparable Savior. He's the source of that living water. And if these guys had actually stopped and read their own scriptures, if they'd remembered he's wonderful, counselor, he's mighty God, that title means hero God. It means the mighty one. It means El who is our hero. That's who Messiah would be. You see, if they actually stopped to read their scriptures, they would start putting together what Jesus was doing and how he was doing it and going, it sure looks like this might be him. He was, in fact, born in Bethlehem. The prophet that he represents was indeed Jonah by the time he goes to the cross and is raised three days later. The very ceremony that they're enacting on the portico of the temple was a picture of his very first miracle. He was basically saying, look, I'm him. Do you believe it? People can hear the greatness of Jesus. They they can hear that he's God. They can hear that he's the father of eternity, just as Isaiah 9 says. They can hear that he's offering a pardon to anyone who will believe that the chastisement for our peace was put upon him, the prophet Isaiah declares, that by his stripes we are healed. You see, if they'd actually started to pull some of their biblical knowledge together, it would have been pretty clear that Jesus was who he said he was. So don't let these arguments that keep people from Jesus keep you from Jesus and I realize the vast majority of us this morning have already believed on his name and we are his children but believe him for the rest of what he wants to do in your life believe him for that transformation of your life believe him for those gifts that he wants to pour into you to use in this world for his kingdom. Believe all that there is that is said about him because it's all truth. And in fact, the truth does set us free. Would you stand with me and let's pray? If you're here today and, and you have not ever given your life to Jesus, We have an amazing prayer team, group of prayer warriors over here in our prayer room. Love to give you one of those get started packets. Love to pray with you to receive Christ. It's as simple as confessing him as Savior and Lord, inviting him into your life. We'd love to see that happen today for you. Don't miss that opportunity for the rest of us. Don't miss the opportunity to be a witness in this world for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We who have been saved have a great obligation because we know the truth to make sure that no one that we know, no one that we come in contact with, escapes this life without having a clear presentation of the gospel message given to them. Take that seriously. That's why we have churches all over the world. That's why we go out on Friday nights and preach all over 
our local community. That's why we minister to homeless people. It's why we have church services. It's why we have men's studies and women's studies. It's why we have children's ministry. All of those things are to point people to our incomparable Savior. Don't miss doing that. Father, thank you for all that you're doing in our presence. Thank you that when you sent Jesus into this world, uh, you sent the one and only Savior. There isn't another. And that message is clear in our Bibles. We thank you for the clarity of that message. Pray that you would give us that same clarity as we share it with other people. Lord, would we lead them to the living water so that they might have opportunity to drink. Thank you for saving us and blessing us. Send us out today with joy and peace, purpose. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen.